What we feared was the worst turned out to be true this morning. Uh, we learned that Sheikh Ahmed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the head of the world's largest sovereign wealth fund, also a brother of Abu Dhabi's ruler, was killed after his glider crashed into a lake in Morocco. For more on what this means for the future of the world's largest sovereign wealth fund, we turn to Rachel Zimba. She's seen a senior analyst who covers sovereign wealth funds at Rubini Global Economics. Thanks so much for coming in, Happy Rachel. Well, we got this confirmation this morning of something that many expected mm -hmm. since um, Sheikh Ahmed's pilot had been found, but he had been missing for so many days since the accident on Friday. Uh, and it brings us back to the question of, of what happens now for the Emirate and for the sovereign wealth fund. Abu Dhabi has very deep pockets, 8% of the world's oil wealth. This fund is tremendous. What happens now to it? Sure. Well, this is obviously very sad news for the Emirate. Of, of Abu Dhabi, but in terms of for the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, I would imagine that this is, there's an element, especially in the short term, of business as usual. Uh, Sheikh Ahmed played a very major role, but so did other members of the board, other members of the ruling family, others in the elite. And so I would imagine you have others, not only in the board, but also in the investment committee that will um, will step up to take on some of the role, some of the guiding role that he played. It's also worth noting that much of, Abu Dhabi, of the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority is actually managed by external managers mm -hmm. um, and closely overseen by the in-house managers. Um, and many of the many of their assets are actually in index-linked products. So in the short term, thankfully, this doesn't have much of an effect, but it could play into um, uh, some of the ongoing discussions about asset allocation uh, in the long-term future of the fund. So there is an executive structure for someone yes. to, to step into to his role. Uh, in, and um, oversee the fund. Uh, take a step back and tell me about some of those executives that you have met with, because we didn't know much about Sheikh Ahmed himself. There was very little disclosure um, that needed to be given or that was shared. But we did recently start to get a, a glimpse inside some of the, the assets that Adia holds. Sure. Well, actually, in the in the first annual report that Adia um, issued a couple Just a weeks, few weeks ago, ago, it actually outlines not only the governance structure but the members of the board and it confirms a certain amount of what we knew about asset allocation and governance that had been available in the press through reports that actually Sheikh Ahmed among others had given um, and so what you see there is a range of a range of uh, board members both from the ruling family um, but also from you know among some of the families who guide the central bank and, and a others lot of ownership for sovereign wealth funds they had very much been active in the financial sector Adia had had a big stake in city and ongoing legal issues. Yes, that's 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 what happens with that. Well, I mean, it's it's very it's very hard to speculate because I think that's based on not only the legal case but also the negotiations that are ongoing between the institutions. I would say that is a large stake in city. Uh, it was initially about a 7.5 billion dollars, but we ha we do have to put that in context of the 400 the mid 400 billion dollars that uh, that that Adia manages. So yes, a significant amount, but. Uh, uh, less than you know, uh, less than five percent of the total um, total portfolio. More and, significant for City than for Adia. Yes. Well, I mean, and and we're we're still seeing with the U.S. government in process of exiting its stake in City. I think this is a very much an ongoing story for all of the investors in City. But more broadly, what you have, if you look at Adia's portfolio, you see uh, about a fifty percent exposure to public equities, a fair amount of that in the United States, but also in Europe and emerging markets. Adia is one of the first sovereign wealth funds to start investing in emerging markets mm -hmm. and they were the leader in uh, investing in private equity in the alternative space which still has a fairly significant part of their portfolio so very much a diversified investor uh, the presumption has been that sovereign wealth funds Adi among them are going to get a little bit more conservative because so many were burned by the financial crisis right um, and we did hear from from Sheikh Ahmed in that recent disclosure mm -hmm. you referenced saying that he sees the overhang of sovereign debt mm -hmm. something he'd know about when they were in yes. Dubai. Um, <laughs> and also low interest rates are introducing an economic cycle we haven't seen in 25 years. So wh what does that tell us about sure. how they're shifting their strategy? Sure. Well, I think what they're looking at is they try to invest for the long term.
firm. They are, they, the goal of Adia is to um, both make significant financial returns but also wealth preservation because what you have in Abu Dhabi, as you mentioned, a very large oil reserves and it's converting that resource wealth into financial wealth that helps in uh, not only cushioning the economy when oil prices fall but also in helping to provide capital to diversify the economy. And so mm -hmm. what I think we've seen over the last few years is also the sponsors of sovereign wealth funds looking to investments that provide domestic benefits as well. More about state interests and less about absolute uh, quick, fast on returns. The, on the margin. And one of the dynamics... We have to leave it there, Rachel. Wonderful. I'm sorry.